I call the Honourable Member for Monash. Well, thank you, Deputy Speaker. But the first thing I want the Australian people to know is this. And we have the actual minister responsible for this bill at the table. We have one Labor member and perhaps another one coming in uh, that is on duty, maybe swapping over. But there's not one member here from the ruling party of Australia prepared to defend this legislation in the House tonight. And that's why you're getting a running commentary from coalition members in the opposition. There's three things that happened before the election campaign. The Albanese opposition then said, you have nothing to fear from electing a Labor government to this, country, to this country's leadership because we are not going to change the stage three tax at, at all. We are not going to change the tax. Secondly, we won't touch your superannuation. We won't go near your superannuation. Thirdly, they said, in regard to COVID, we will have a royal commission into our COVID response. And what happened when the Prime Minister became Prime Minister? All three he failed on. There is no royal commission. He changed the superannuation arrangements, which he said he wouldn't change the superannuation arrangements, and he changed the tax arrangements. Now, I'm not here to argue with the Deputy Treasurer whether this is fair, right or wrong or not. I'm only saying that they broke the trust with the Australian people that they asked for before the election campaign. People that voted for the Labor Party in good faith, in the full knowledge that there won't be a change to superannuation. And you may say, oh, but this is only a change for wealthy people. No, this is a change for people that have worked hard. And I'll come to farmers in a minute and how this affects them. The important thing, Deputy Speaker, is this. When politicians present themselves to the Australian people and say, here is our plan. If you elect us, this is what we will do. We, the Australian people, expect you will do what you will say you will do, not change the basic fundamental arguments that you raised within the election campaign. I'm not saying they're broken promises. They're broken trust agreements with the Australian people. They're broken trust and when trust in politicians in this nation and around the world is at an all-time low. Go and talk to the people in the street about what they think about politicians. I've been in and out of this place since 1990. I've faced 13 election campaigns. Sadly, four of them were unsuccessful. But I'm here and I have a memory, a memory of governments, of Labor governments, that took away from single mums their parental pension, or their parental payment, I should say, to care for their children, and cut it from 12 years of age to seven years of age. Then the Albanese government comes in and raises it from seven to 12 and says, pat us on the back. Look what we've done for single mothers. I was here when you took it away. I raised it time after time after time that, is, that it's a right thing for when a child turns 12 and can get themselves off to school and mum can get out and get a job and get on with life. But at seven, I think mums are very protective about their children at seven, especially single mums, and they have to make special arrangements if they're working. Now, I said I'd talk about farmers, and I don't want to run out of time, because every time you're in the chair, Deputy Chair, I tend to run out of time on very important issues, and I don't intend to do that tonight. From a farming perspective, and I'm from a farming electorate, in which many farmers use their self-managed super funds to secure, to protect their assets, and pass it on to future generations uh, or whatever it is in their business. These are assets that have been built up over many years of hard work. Often these farmers have started out as share farmers on dairy farms. 
They've finally paid for their herd. After they've paid for their herd, they start looking for an opportunity to put a deposit on a dairy farm. Very, very difficult. Very hard work. Seven days a week, non-stop. Whole family involved. And I pay tribute to every farmer tonight, but more importantly, I pay tribute to dairy farmers. If you drive up my drive, Deputy Speaker, and I hope you do one day, there's a drive up to the house driveway, then you come up to the house. When you just get near the house, you will notice two milk cans. Those milk cans aren't there because they're pretty. They're rusted and they're old, and they're rotted in the bottom. But every time I drive up my driveway, I remember that I come from a dairying community. And our businesses, which were the original grocery store and then the drapery store, they were born out of the money made on dairy farms. And in those days, you could have a 40-acre dairy farm and you could buy a Holden every two years. And hopefully you shopped at Broadbent's. Having said that, I'm reminded every time I drive up my driveway, my wife says, get rid of the milk cans. I can't get rid of the milk cans because they're part of who I am. I come from a dairy community. Yes, those assets have been built up over many years. And, it, uh, I, I, and I, rec I commend the member for Nichols today, who spoke on the, this bill and his words of support for farmers in his electorate. I would have to echo the same sentiment so we take for granted the sacrifice and risk that farmers take and their families take to feed the nation. They put, as, as the member for Ford said, they put food on the table. Milk doesn't come out of cartons and bottles. It comes out of cows and it comes out of sweat and hard work. Beef comes from grass-fed beef, if you, if you can afford grass-fed beef anymore. And, and the cost of living is really putting some pressure on that. Um, we haven't got quite to the uh, stage of having a $100 leg of lamb, but by gee, we're not far away. I know I remember the statement from the member from New England. This bill, with other policy themes under the Labor government, discourages farming from doing their honourable work on our behalf. And worse, it, did, it disproportionately proposes a serious threat to the next generation of farmers, which I'm sure the member for Forest will bring up too. There's enough now of the next generation of farmers that don't want to continue on the farm because they know what their mum and dad have been through to get them to that point. And they, are, they have always helped out on the farm like every kid's on farms do. They're helpers in the farm. So it, it's been a family commitment. But because they've seen how hard it is to make money on a farm today, they, they, they want to be doctors and lawyers and all those sorts of things, as the song goes. They don't necessarily want to be farmers. So you haven't got the family coming through saying, I want to be. Now, if you, under this proposal, if you make it even harder for farmers and the next generation, they're going to walk away. They already feel a, the, the next generation of farmers that do want to farm already feel abandoned by the government through policies such as committing to closing the live sheep export businesses, it sends a message that it's live sheep now, it's live cattle next. We're coming after you and we're coming after farmers with all sorts of environmental restrictions that the previous generations never had to deal with. The biosecurity levy is another one where the government's passing on the buck onto farmers, putting it onto farmers. Biosecurity is a responsibility of all of us, not just farmers, every one of us. You know, I've been through a stage where we had um, disease on farms where you couldn't walk onto a farm without washing your boots and you couldn't take your car onto the farm just in case. You couldn't transfer tractors from one property to another just in case you picked up something that took it onto the farm. I mean, biosecurity is absolutely important. That's why I was against the importation of apples from New Zealand who had a disease over there. You know, and we railed against and pushed against and pushed against it. What happened? Oh, the disease snuck into Australia by chance. Just snuck in here. So now it's here. We have no objection to importing the apples from New Zealand. No, we should never have imported apples from New Zealand. And we should put up barriers for our own protection, our bioprotection, because what protects our food and our farmers protects us. And what we eat is very important for our children. 
You know, when I was growing up, and like people of my age, all the food that we ate came within probably 10 k's of where we lived. All the food. You might have some canned food now and again, but not a lot. Not a lot. There wasn't a lot around. So our food was seasonal, was healthy, was good for us. Our milk didn't come in bottles. It came in a billy at the front gate, straight from the farm. Our bread was delivered by the bread man. You know, it was a, a wonderful time to be alive and eating the freshest food create, created and grown on the Kuirup Swamp. You couldn't ask for a better food source than the Kuirup Swamp that it is today. And I know all of you are still eating the asparagus today that is grown in the Kuirup Swamp and the potatoes that are grown in the rest of my electorate. So that next generation of farmers are going to be offended by this. The, but just to, to, to put another position, though, if you change the rules, and I put this to Deputy Treasurer, if you change the rules, you have to compensate the individual who is affected by that change of rules. That's called trust. You can say, righto, oh, if you've in invested in your superannuation fund and it's over three million dollars, so you've got $3 million in there, but it's over $3 million we're going to change your taxation arrangements. You should allow anybody at that point to withdraw their funds from their superannuation, no matter what age they are, because you've changed the rules, withdraw the money from the superannuation and invest it in any way they would like. If they want to invest it in property, they want to invest it in shares, they want to invest it in other forms of investment, do the right thing and let them up. Oh, that's it. Oh, no, you can't do that. Oh, no, 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 no. Because who's dominating? The big union superannuation funds are directing what they can and can't do. They don't want, this government does not want self-managed superannuation funds. The big superannuation funds do not want self-managed superannuation funds. You have forced us, who do have a self-managed superannuation fund, to have a digital identity, and if you don't do it, I think it was by the 22nd of September last year, we're going to fine you $1.1 million. Really, why do my wife and I have to have a digital identity to run our own self-managed superannuation fund? It's crazy stuff. And I can't imagine, Deputy Speaker, the regulation that is, that is put on this generation that previous generations never had to deal with. I mean, since, since the early 80s, we've been paying capital gains tax. You know, we're paying now land tax we didn't pay before. And that's increasing exponentially every year. Now, I know that's not a federal tax, but it's affecting everything the federal government does because we have a rental crisis in Australia. Why do we have a rental crisis in Australia? Because landlords are selling their properties to people who are going to live in that property and there's no rental left. I have estate agents that are losing as many as 150 landlords every three months in country areas. And then we have a rental crisis. Why have we got a rental crisis? Because of government policy. State government policy, policies they think that are good for the renter, that will establish you know, the, the, the rights of the person renting the house. I grew up with caveat emptor, let the market beware. Let the buyer beware. Caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. Let the people of Australia make their own decisions on their own behalf. If you don't want to rent at that price, don't rent at that price. But, but rentals are being taken off the market, caused by government policy and only government policy. Look, it is sad where this nation's headed, by people who are making regulations around our farmers, around our community, around superannuation, that is not backed by common sense. It's not until you have dirt under your finger, fingernails, Deputy Speaker, that you would understand many of the issues that I'm talking about tonight. 
and thanks for the opportunity to address this parliament and the people of Australia.